Today we're going to talk about content marketing done right, how to avoid pirating content. Thank you for joining the webinar today. This is a topic I'm very passionate about, uh, content marketing, but more so content curation and the ethics around it. Uh, we're going to cop cover copyright law, ethics, fair use, all of that in today's presentation to make sure you have all the tools and best practices you need to ensure that you are not uh, accidentally pirating content. So with that, let's get started. First, let's look at Marketing Mary. Many of us can empathize with Marketing Mary. Many of us have been in her shoes. Um, so here she is. She's responsible for content marketing in her organization. She says, I need to get yet another blog post out today. And she's, she's kind of looking and wondering what to do. Darn, I can't think of anything right now. Uh, I can't really do Marketing Mary's voice, but I'm, I'm going to try here. Um, and she's really hit writer's block. She doesn't know what she should write. She's written about all the topics she can think of at the moment. So what does she decide to do? says, hmm, let me see what other people are writing about. So she goes and searches online and looks for different things people are talking about that, that may interest her audience. And look, she comes across this. Wait a minute. Here's a relevant blog post that my audience would love. She found this great blog post written by another party uh, about the content marketing pyramid. Okay, this is a great blog post. My audience is going to love this. Let me see. Let me uh, just rework this a little bit. Um, I'm just going to put this in my blog format here. Maybe uh, make a couple of changes here and there. And guess what? That was easy. I'm done with the blog post in 10 minutes. Now I can go on with the rest of my day and work on all my other marketing campaigns and activities. Uh, and I'm done with my content marketing responsibilities for the day. But after a few hours, she goes back and looks at her, her blog post. And she starts wondering, hmm, I hope I really did this right. I hope I, I you know, did this in an ethical manner and I don't get in trouble. Uh, but in reality, she didn't do this right. There's a lot of things that are wrong with this post here. And uh, we're going to talk through that. Um, she accidentally pirated content. And not because she had a, any bad intentions. It could happen to any of us. Uh, she just didn't know the best practices. So we're going to talk through some of those best practices to ensure that you don't fall in the same boat as Mark and Mary in this example. So in terms of agenda, we're going to talk through the evolution of content marketing and how we got here and how the demand for content marketing has perhaps accidentally encouraged some, some piracy of content. Next, we're going to specifically talk about content curation and define what it is. Um, content curation uh, relates to ethics very much because it fundamentally relies on third-party content. Uh, after that, we'll go through the basics of fair use and copyright law and how it applies to marketers. Then we'll go through 12 best practices and tips for ethical and effective curation to make sure you're, you're doing content marketing right. And we'll wrap up with some examples of uh, real-world marketers who are publishing content, and we'll grade them and look at how closely they're following ethical best practices. All right, so with that, let's look at content marketing. Uh, about a year ago, we surveyed over 400 marketers uh, and B2B marketers about their marketing strategies, and we found that content marketing was the predominant marketing strategy. It was uh, number one at 87% of B2B marketers were using content marketing. Um, this is outpacing SEO, 68%, events, 62%, TV, radio, print at 26%. So by far, content marketing is the most popular uh, marketing strategy. And keep in mind, these numbers are, are a little dated. They're from 2012, so the number has only increased. So with that, given that so many marketers are interested in content marketing and are doing content marketing, it causes a side effect in our organization. The side effect is called the content marketing beast. Um, at Curata, uh, we refer to the beast as kind of that insatiable demand for producing content. You have to produce content day in, day out to feed this beast. You have to produce Facebook posts, blog posts, microsites, case studies, videos, ebooks, data sheets, webinars, white papers, tweets, Google Plus posts, podcasts, press releases, and the list goes on and on and on. And the worst thing is, it's not just a one time thing. You don't just feed the beast and you're done. You post on Facebook, you tweet. You create a blog post, and before you know it, uh, an hour later, maybe a day later, maybe a week later, it's time to produce yet another piece of content. And so we often joke that the content beast has a high metabolism. As soon as you give it food, it's ready for more. Um, and so that constant demand for content has, in many ways, uh, put pressures on marketing departments. And as a result, um, some marketers inadvertently result to piracy. So we're going to make sure that does not happen by going through some ethical best practices so that you can feed the content beast but not resort to uh, piracy. 
So one way to address the content beast is to uh, turn to content curation. And content curation is the ethical way of feeding the content beast by relying on third-party content. Now there are a lot of definitions for content curation floating out there. It could be used to describe uh, social media sites like Pinterest or Twitter, uh, e-commerce sites like Etsy, or publishing models like, like Reddit and other social sites. Uh, but this is a definition that I like the best, I think really encapsulates content curation and, and the heart of it and how it relates to marketers. So I'm going to read it out and we'll, we'll dive into it. Here it says, content curation is when an individual or team consistently finds, curates, and shares the most relevant and highest quality digital content on a specific topic for their target market. So let's pick this definition apart. First, content curation is done by an individual or team. It's done by a person, not an algorithm. If it's an algorithm, that is aggregation. So it has a very human touch. It has a curator at the center of it. Next, it's not a one-time activity or event. It's something you have to do consistently, something you have to do day in, day out. It's a long-term strategy, just like content marketing, just like feeding the content beast. Um, it's also a three-part process where the uh, curator is finding curating or annotating and sharing content. So it's about adding value, adding perspective, adding insight, adding guidance, uh, not just piping in and out content. Um, it's about being selective, finding the most relevant and highest quality content, being discerning, discriminative, and selective. Uh, in, this is a good example of where less is more. You're boiling down uh, the real essence of a topic or issue for your audience so that they don't have to wade through all the content themselves. And lastly, it has a laser focus on your audience. You're curating content on a specific topic for a specific market and not just finding everything under the sun. So with that, uh, content curation uh, fundamentally relies on third-party content. So let, now let's talk about fair use and copyright law and we'll talk about how that relates to content curation and then dive into some best practices. So with that, uh, let's look at fair use law. So fair use law is in uh, American law in, in, in the United States. And fair use can be applied in a number of different circumstances. So what, do the, what does the law say? It says fair use can apply in uh, places where you're using quotations or excerpts in a review or criticism for the purposes of illustration or comment. So you're using excerpts and you're really using to illustrate a point. Um, you may have done this in an essay back in college. Uh, or you're commenting on, a, on, a on an issue. Um, another place where fair use can apply is we're recording short passages in scholarly or technical work to really illustrate or clarify a point or your observations. Um, it could be used in parody. Um, it, so uh, example would be Saturday Night Live. They parody a lot of uh, advertisements on TV, a lot of movies, and that all falls under fair use. They don't necessarily have to ask for permission. Um, and lastly, um, it can be used to summarize. Uh, when you're summarizing, uh, summarizing um, a, an article, for example, or a news report, um, that can be considered fair use. We're not taking the full news report, but summarizing it down. Now, fair use is kind of a gray area. It's hard to clearly define what is fair use and what is not. But here are some of the considerations that the law looks at. Uh, the first is the purpose and the character of the use. If you're using it for nonprofit educational uses, um, generally that's considered fair use. If it's used for commercial use, um, it may not be considered uh, fair use. Now, most of us content marketers are performing content marketing for commercial means. Um, and the question is, how does that fit into this definition? Well, it could be argued that um, you're really doing it to educate your audience. That's what a lot of content marketing is. It's either to inform and educate or entertain your audience. And if you're doing it to uh, educate your audience, it could be argued that you are doing it for educational purposes at the end of the day. Uh, second is the nature of the copyright work. What type of work is it that you're, that you're uh, yeah, um, kind of repurposing. Uh, the third is the amount and substantiality of uh, the work. So how much of the original work are you taking? Uh, and the last is the effect on the potential market uh, for the copyrighted work. So for example, um, I think this fair use law kind of evolved from a book in the 70s that talked about the Watergate memos and um, it, there was another book that came along and really took the heart of the original book's work. They summarized it down, took the exact quotations, the really core meat of the work, and uh, that was really where fair use law came into play and decided that the latter book 
um, impacted the potential market of the former book because it's really giving away the essence of the, the original book and people were not buying the the, the larger form uh, version of the book. So, um, so if you're detracting from the sales of a copyrighted work, um, that, that could be considered non-fair use. So with that, let's dive into 12 best practices to really do a content marketing and more specifically curation ethically, keeping a fair use in mind. So first of all, I want to put a big disclaimer here. I'm not a lawyer. I am no Jack McCoy uh, for you Law & Order fans. I'm no Saul Goodman for you Breaking Bad fans. Um, so please uh, keep that in mind. And um, the interpretation of fair use does change from organization to organization. So for you know actual professional advice, go, go uh, talk to your uh, company's legal counsel. Uh, so for purpose of illustration, we'll take this blog post here, the content marketing pyramid. Um, that Mark and Mary found, and we'll work through this using the 12 best practices to morph this into an ethical piece of curation. So uh, step one here, uh, we go and we copy and paste that whole blog post into a, a document. Um, so we've taken it word for word and, and copy and pasted it here. Right now this is piracy. So let's, let's work on this and make this an ethical act of curation. So best practice number one, and the first five best practices come from Kimberly Isbell of the Harvard Law and the Neiman Jour Journalism Lab, and I've appended on uh, marketing reasons why I should follow this, and then I've then added seven more best practices that I think um, need, you need to follow in, as well because the five really don't cover it, and we'll go over that as well. So number one here, reproduce only those portions of the headline or article that are necessary to make your point or to identify the story. Do not reproduce the story in its entirety. Um, and so this kind of goes back to fair use law and the substantiality of the work that you're copying. So you don't want to reproduce the whole thing. From a marketing perspective, um, you don't want to take the whole work because Google considers that duplicative content and it could hurt you from an SEO perspective as well. So let's go to the uh, blog post here and we're going to uh, take the highlighted excerpt and that's all we're going to keep. We're going to get rid of the rest of the content here. And so now we've trimmed it down to a much shorter piece of content. And so we haven't taken the whole blog post. All right, best practice number two. Try not to use all or even the majority of articles available from a single source. Limit yourselves to those articles that are directly, directly relevant to your audience. So don't just pipe in all the content from a single source. Really be selective as a curator um, and only link to the most relevant content. And I think that makes you, forces you to stay on topic. And by using multiple sources, not just one source, you become a comprehensive resource for your audience. Otherwise, they'll just go directly uh, to that one source that you constantly curate. So to be a good curator, uh, it it's all, also makes sense to follow this best practice. Um, since we're talking about a single blog post, I don't have an illustrated example of this. So we'll jump on to best practice number three. Prominently identify the source of the article. Um, and the marking reason why you should follow this is demonstrating you've curated content from a, a wide variety of sources um, and showing where you got your content makes you more credible as well. Um, so for example, in this blog post here, we're going to say that recently Michael Girard from uh, Curata published a great framework for how to think about this. and by complimenting him and recognizing source, you can now establish a relationship with him as well. So it's good from a fair use perspective, but also uh, just in terms of engaging with influencers who are creating great content as well. All right, best practice number four, wherever possible, link to the original source of the article. Uh, and again, for a lot of marketers, linking to another site uh, may seem like you're driving traffic away from you. Uh, it may seem like um, you know you're giving away your your uh, valuable audience and driving them elsewhere. Uh, but this really makes you more credible at the end of the day by linking to to another source. Uh, so, for example, if the New York Times has a great blog, a great article that agrees with the same perspective that uh, I have. Even if I link to a third-party source, uh, it makes me uh, more credible by by having the same viewpoint as the New York Times. Um, so with that, we're going to add a couple of links. Uh, so at the bottom here in highlighted, uh, it says check out the original blog post. So we added a link there back to the original post. All right, best practice number five, wherever possible, provide context and commentary for the material you use. So why should you follow this? Uh, one, the more original context you can use, the more of your marketing message you can incorporate. Rather than just taking someone else's message, you can now incorporate 
your own keywords, your own message into the third party. And especially if you disagree with the uh, original article, uh, this is a good place to enter your, your message into the mix. Um, also, if the audience values your commentary, they will keep coming back to you as a good source for content and good source for commentary rather than going back to the original source. So let's go ahead and add some commentary. So I'm going to use uh, what's known as a block quote tag. Um, so that's just uh, kind of centering the content. Um, it's a good tag for demarcating what is your commentary and the original work. So the original content is now kind of centered there. Um, and then I'm going to add some additional commentary about why this framework, the content marking pyramid, is so important and what I like about it. So I added my own perspective there. And so now we'll move on to the the remaining seven recommendations and these are ones that I've added on top of the additional five. So best practice number six uh, and this relates to images. So when sharing images unless you have explicit permission to share a full-size image always share an image thumbnail at most. So similar to best practice number one which says only use a small portion of the original text this relates to images only share a small portion of the original image and you can do so by thumbnailing it. So we're going to take that image and thumbnail it down, and now we're sharing only small, uh, a smaller version of the original image. This doesn't necessarily say that you uh, it's okay uh, from a copyright perspective to, to use a, uh, a thumbnailed image, but it's it puts you in a better position. And to be completely safe, you should you know ask the original author. So if it's a royalty or stock photo site, you you still probably would need to license it. But if it's not, if it's an infographic, a framework, um, usually people are okay with that if you cite the source. But the the best way to do is to get permission. All right, uh, best practice number seven, link to the original article prominently, not right all the way down at the end of the post. And we'll come back to this in some of the uh, examples and case studies we look at. Uh, but the reason why I added this is best practice number four that just says link to the original post doesn't really say where that link should be. Um, and uh, this discourages readers if you've linked in a non-prominent way um, from visiting the original publisher and they could be considered as hurting the market for that content because uh, you may be hurting their advertising revenue uh, and it's also just not fair that you're not uh, kind of recognizing the original publisher for their contribution. So we're going to go ahead and add a more prominent link. So aside from the link at the bottom that says check out the original blog post, we're adding a, additional two links at the top. Uh, one to the company that published this, so Curata there, and we're also going to add a link uh, to the word great framework right at the very top so people can't miss it. Okay, best practice number eight. If you're reposting an excerpt from the original article, make sure your excerpt only represents a small portion of the original article. So uh, while best practice number one recommends you should never republish the entire original article, there's still a lot of latitude here. Um, and you can publish a kind of a, a large portion of the original article. So this says make sure you're only publishing a small excerpt that doesn't kind of consist of 80% of the article, for example. So we're going to cut down our excerpt just for illustrative purposes. I'm going to knock down that first sentence of the excerpt because it adds a little value. And uh, we're going to move on to best practice number nine. So this is uh, an important one. If you're reposting an, ex an excerpt from the original article, make sure your commentary is longer than the uh, excerpt you're reposting. In, in plain speak, uh, give more than you take. If you're taking an excerpt, make sure you give more commentary back than the amount that you're taking. Um, and there are three reasons why this is important. One, it ensures you're a adding substantial new value. Two, it forces you to take less um, content than, than, uh, than you're giving back. So it prevents you from taking very large excerpts of the original content. And three, it's good from an SEO perspective because um, you're adding more original content so Google is less likely to recognize you as a duplicative source. So if there's kind of one rule you take away out of the 12, this is probably the one I would follow because it encapsulates a lot of the others. Uh, but there is value in the other rules as well. So let's go ahead and make sure we give more than we take. So I, in between the paragraphs, have now added additional commentary. And now there's more commentary on this page than the amount that I took uh, and excerpted out. Best practice number 10, retitle any and all content you curate. 
Um, and there are three reasons why I think you should follow this aside from a fair use perspective. One is you're no longer uh, competing for the same title in search results. So when people search for that title in Google, uh, you're unlikely to come up before the original source um, because you have a smaller curated version. So you might as well go ahead and retitle the article so that you can be on the first page uh, for a slightly different title. Two, uh, it's kind of fun. You can wear your creative hat, add your own spin, particularly if you're sharing the content on Twitter. So you can make a more kind of sensational title that people will click on. Uh, and three, from an SEO perspective, you can incorporate your own keywords that may not occur in the original uh, title to start with. So let's go ahead, um, and I just retitled the article here uh, from repurpose. It's now repurposing content effectively using the content marketing pyramid. And I want to have repurposing content somewhere in the title. Those are the keywords I was targeting. And I was able to incorporate those in, in the new title. All right, uh, we're almost there. Best practice number 11. Uh, if you're using a share bar or iframe, give the reader an option to close the iframe or share bar to view the content without it. Um, so share bars and iframes, uh, let me show you a quick example here. Uh, these are usually bars that stripe across the top. Um, you may have seen them on uh, services like Newsly or uh, LinkedIn Today used to have them. Uh, Hootsuite's Owly bar has it. They're these little bars that hover above another piece of content and uh, they allow you to have different social sharing and commenting functions. Uh, but sometimes they can be annoying for readers. So. Um, you always want to give the option to close those bars um, and uh, if a reader doesn't want them. And so they, a, a, a consumer can view the content uh, directly at the publisher's URL rather than in a masked URL that you're providing. So in the event that you're using a share bar or an iframe, um, do it like this. Have uh, on the top right here, have options to either hide this bar uh, for now or permanently and cookie them so that the bar will never appear in the future. I think it's just good good etiquette. Uh, best practice number 12, don't use no follows on your links to the original publisher's content. Uh, the no follow attribute, it's basically a small tag that goes on links that tell search engines not to give SEO credit to where you've linked to. Uh, these were originally developed uh, so that comments on a blog post um, don't have no follows so that search engine can distinguish between legitimate links in a blog post uh, where the author is giving credit to another source and uh, links that appear in comments which often are spammy and uh, so that search engines know that the author is not giving credit to those links. However, these days some content curation platforms by default link to the original source using no follow tags. Uh, and that's not, uh, I think, a good etiquette because you're not giving SEO credit to the original content source where you originated that content from. Um, and so here's an example. Um, of where uh, you know we've taken that the blog post in its full form uh, that we pirated and you, you know all the links are no ha, don't have no follows and we've now morphed it into this ethical blog post so we've added our own perspective we've shrunk down the images we've retitled it and by following these 12 best practices we now have uh, kind of an ethically curated blog post now, it may seem a little daunting. This may seem a lot of work to follow. It's a lot of commentary to add. And you know, I did this for illustrative purposes. You may take less content out, so you can comment a lot less, and it doesn't have to be uh, this, this large. Um, but also, there are technologies that can help you along the way. So I've kind of put together this graph here about how you can curate effectively and efficiently. Uh, and so if you were to curate manually, you, you may spend you know, 15 minutes to find a piece of content, 20 minutes to editorialize it and work through kind of all the best practices. Um, and then it may take you 10 minutes to post it out to your blog, to all your social channels, uh, post packages up to the email newsletter, send it out. Um, if you were to pirate content and do it wrong, it would still take you the same amount of time to find that content. It would still take you 15 minutes. It may take you two minutes to editorialize, really just to cut and paste, and 10 minutes to then post and distribute the content. Um, however, using content curation technology like Curata, um, you can do this much more efficiently. So what Curata does is uh, it helps you find the content. So you may spend two minutes just browsing through already relevant content that the engine has surfaced up. Uh, you then will still need to take a significant amount of time to editorialize the content. So it may take you 15 minutes. Uh, but it's less than you know doing it manually because uh, a lot of these technologies will automatically handle some of these best practices, particularly if they're business-grade platforms. So they'll 
automatically thumbnail images, all automatically make sure your excerpts are minimized and so forth. So it may take you 15 versus 20 minutes. And lastly, the posting uh, in Curata, for example, is seamless. So as soon as you hit publish, it gets scheduled to be distributed on your, all your channels. So really, where curation technology helps um, isn't so much in the annotation and um, adding your own perspective, but really in knocking down the most tedious elements of the process, which are finding and posting the content and uh, some of the um, ethical aspects. So you can really focus on adding value at the end of the day. All right, and with that, uh, we're going to go through some uh, examples at top of, and the bottom of the class. And in uh, grade school style, we're going to give them A through F uh, grades in terms of how they've curated content. So let's start. Uh, this is uh, the uh, site uh, TPM Livewire, and here they have an article about uh, uh, Snowden, and um, this gets an A because uh, they have cited a Guardian article. Um, they have clearly linked to it. It says released on Monday. They've taken small quotes from the article, but they've added sufficient perspective and commentary such that it's almost like a new article. They've retitled it right in the title itself. It's a Snowden in interview with the Guardian, so they've clearly cited who they got it from. So this gets an A in my book, uh, the talking points memo here. All right, next is a site called Slashdot. Uh, this is uh, News for Nerds. Uh, this is uh, when I was back at MIT. This is a, a very popular site that a lot of students would follow. Um, and they kind of curate uh, different news from around the world uh, that relate to tech. So here they have one about Microsoft. They've taken a small excerpt. They've linked to the uh, original source very prominently. Uh, and they've kind of retitled the, uh, the, the post here. Um, so they are clearly linking to original source. They're driving people to original publication to read more of the content, but they haven't added a lot of commentary themselves. So this gets a, a, a B plus in my book. Um, here's another example. This is from uh, CMO.com, a curation site, a content marketing site run by Adobe. Um, and here they have uh, curated a site for mobile marketer. Um, they've taken an excerpt verbatim. They haven't added much commentary themselves. And, but they are driving people back to the original publisher. So again, they haven't added a lot of commentary or value here, um, so I'm going to give them a B in this case. Um, here's another example. This is a Business Insider. They have a newsletter, and they take the titles of posts and have stitched them together. So this is kind of a roundup of 10 things you need to know in tech for the week. Um, so again, they haven't added a lot of co context or commentary, but they're very clearly driving people back to the original publisher. So again, they get a B. All right, next is the Huffington Post, and they have updated their site th since then, so they have made improvements, but uh, this has taken a while back, and a lot of people in the media and publishing industry resent the Huffington Post uh, for some of their, their practices, and, and this is, I think, a good example of why I give them a grade C. Um, here they've taken an article from the New York Times from a, a Paul Krugman blog post and written their own article around it, um, taking quotes from it and talking about the issue. Um, and uh, the deceptive thing here is they have actually linked back to the original source, uh, but it's very hard to, to, uh, to find where they've linked to it. So if you take your nose and touch the monitor, you can notice there's a slight purplish, dark purplish font for the links compared to the text, which is in black. And when you mouse over it, you'll see that it underlines uh, on the site. Uh, but it's deceptive, uh, and they're not clearly linking to the original source and, uh, and in some ways being evasive and trying not to drive people to the original publisher. So uh, for that, I give them a C here. Uh, here's the outsell curated newsletter. Uh, they are taking uh, you know content um, and linking back to the original source. They're taking uh, abstracts here, um, but they're not saying where they got the content from. They don't actually say the uh, the source for the curated content, even though they are linking back to the original uh, publication. So for that, for not telling where they got the content from, uh, and not for and for not adding commentary, I'm going to give them a C. Uh, here's a content creation platform known as Scoop It, and here a user is scooping a piece of content. Um, and this uh, example gets a grade D uh, for a no number of reasons. One, the title is the same. The image is full size, uh, which could get them in hot water in, under copyright law. Um, and the actual curated post that's uh, kind of cropped here has the full content of, of the article. Uh, and lastly, you can't really see it, uh, but on the hyperlink to the original article, uh, they use a nofollow link. So the original publisher, despite all their efforts and providing good content, uh, gets no SEO credit as well. And that's something they build into their platform, which I consider unethical. 
All right, and uh, lastly, we get to uh, example here. This is um, in the small uh, insert here. Uh, it has the original article I wrote on contentcurationmarketing.com on content curation and analytics. And uh, a group called Pax Hill Mar Marketing uh, took my blog post in full, the full text, copy and paste on their blog, um, and uh, and decided to go ahead and publish that. Um, they've since taken it down after I informed them that I wasn't pleased about this, uh, but they received a grade F for that because that is just uh, uh, piracy, kind of like what Marking Mary did at the beginning of this webinar. So uh, I hope these uh, 12 best practices and great examples help to illustrate how to do content curation ethically uh, so you can produce content here to do it right, uh, like Marking Mary now has. Um, and with that, I just want to leave you with a few resources and a summary. So uh, in summary, one, uh, do curate content. It does help your audience and your organization uh, to, one, feed the content beast, but two, drive them to the most relevant content out there. Two, get familiar with fair use and copyright laws. If you're using third-party content, um, you should be familiar with fair use and copyright. Uh, three, follow the 12 best practices that we've prescribed here, and um, they should generally uh, guide you well. But you know, if there are any intricacies that you're confused about, I would suggest consulting with your in-house uh, legal team. Uh, and, and then three, uh, learn from the best and worst practices that we illustrated. Try to strive to be an A uh, at the top of the class and then not at the bottom of the class. And with that, uh, if you're interested in this topic for a deeper dive, uh, please go to curata.com slash resources or the bit.ly link seen on the screen here uh, to read more about content marketing done right and the ethics of, of content curation. Uh, we have 25 pages of in-depth analysis, best practices, how this relates to Google Plus authorship, uh, creative commons, it's another kind of uh, a copyright framework that lets you uh, f easily find third-party content that you can use with permission. Uh, we have uh, links to other tools online that will help you see if images are copyrighted or not and so forth. So this is really the deep dive book for content marketing done right uh, and it's available at this link. Uh, thanks a lot for attending the webinar and uh, good luck uh, and go forth and, and curate ethically and do it right. Thanks a lot.